When the first female mayor of Hildale, Utah was elected in 2018, most of the city employees resigned, some stating they wouldn't work for a woman and an apostate. It's Fundamentalist Friday, and we're talking about the FLDS community of Short Creek. Hey, welcome everybody to Profiling Evil, and thank you so much for tuning in. Now, in this episode, we're going to be talking about government inside of the FLDS and Hildale, Utah, back then and now. Now, I want to thank Sam Zitting Weissen from the YouTube channel Growing Up in Polygamy for joining me on this journey through Short Creek. I really hope that you'll all go over to Sam and Melissa's channel and subscribe. It's really the best way to get an insider's view of life inside the polygamous community. You see, Sam grew up in the FLDS, and he got the courage at about age 18 to leave. He met the love of his life, Melissa, and now they're raising a family and enjoying a life out on the outside. And they are on the outside, folks. Well, we're starting at the baby cemetery because it was there that I asked Sam to share a little bit about the house in which he grew up, which happened to be over our shoulders as we were talking. Now, I wanted to talk about some of the signage that was on his home and many of the others in the community back then. And you're going to just I think you're going to like this exchange, especially the moment when Sam realizes that there's something different that he hadn't noticed for a long time. Let's jump into that video right now. And please forgive me for the audio. The wind was blowing and I didn't catch it until we got home. But the comments are great and I didn't want to forget them. So please cut me some slack on that hey one. welcome back everyone sam here from growing up in polygamy and i'm mike from profiling evil i am currently standing right in front of my childhood home that i moved into about the age of nine or ten years old uh, before this home i was living in a double wide trailer with my family and all of my siblings so you can imagine how fun that was how do 34 <laughs> people live in a double wide trailer well you live on top of each other that's what you do <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> and you know what in the winter time it helped to keep the place warm with that many people in there but about the age of nine or ten i moved across the street into the home you see behind us here and that was my childhood home where i had most of my memories here in, in hilldale utah well you know it's interesting because this is actually how i met you sam is is uh, i was watching a video i was actually out here taking pictures of the old zion archways that used to be over yes. some of the homes and uh and i saw that on one of your videos and that's when i first had contact with you yeah yeah, and that's something that during the time, this was after Warren Jeffs was put in prison, and you probably can't see it here. Maybe we can get a closer shot. But Zion... It's no, longer there. no, that's why we were going to talk about it. In fact, um, I'm, and I'm glad that you just realized that because that has been torn down, that fence line yes. and everything. But I'm sure that you have a photograph that we could put in here to to, yes. to show people what that looked like. We do. So but it's a sign of how things are changing. But explain what was yes. going on so there. I honestly didn't realize until this <laughs> moment that the Zion sign was on our big rock fence that we had built around our our home there, around our yard. And that, that rock fence took us a lot of time sweat tears to get that up and going and so to to look at it now and see that it's all torn down that's a little bit disheartening but but zion was put on there as a sign of saying we stand strong and we are living and obeying warren jeffs even though he's in prison we are a part of that group that still believes he is a prophet of god and so you would see throughout the community not so much anymore because most of warren's followers have moved out but you see zion above the door or zion above uh, on the fence or something and that was just an outward sign of their faithfulness to warren jeffs you know i i remember driving by those and, and frankly being a little disturbed by what i saw not much different than the uep i saw on the side of another house again just declarations of who's in charge and what this community is all about. But as I did some research too, I, I reflected on 
the the biblical Passover and the the uh, painting around the doorway yes, yes. Uh, in in biblical times. And as I talked to people that would share things years ago, it also came out that that was a place of refuge where someone walking down the street would know that there was a fellow believer. That is very true, and that's something I wanted to point out. And in the UEP that we had just shown footage of before this was when I saw that, I was so proud to be a part of this tight-knit group that, you know, that we would we would display our faithfulness to a certain group and our, our desire to follow God's church, as we thought. And so I imagine, I wasn't here during the time when people started throwing these signs up, the Zion signs up around their homes, but I imagine it was similar that they were very proud to see there were other people that believed as they believe. Yeah. Because so many families were showing up from different places, from Salt Lake City area, when they were told to move down to, to Short Creek or from Canada, different places they were moving in. And so we were popping up houses left and right, trying to get places for people to stay. And so I was just under the impression that there wasn't time or money to finish the outside. We just needed to finish the inside. You know, it, it uh, always disturbed me, not only from the fact that they were getting away with taxes and who wouldn't want to bank what you pay in property taxes every year and use it somewhere else, <laughs> right. but um, that paid for the roads that you were driving on, many in this community, which were dirt, and, and there sure. still, still are very are few, lot, yes. yeah, there are very few even curb and gutter in, in this community, right. but um, that was always troubling to me. But I guess what was more troubling was the fact that families like yours or families like your neighbor right there uh -huh. were living in really destitute conditions and yet mansions were being built for your prophet and your leaders. And of course, those mansions for the leaders were being done on the outside in very beautiful homes inside and out. And not to mention that these homes were being built by the community members. I spent much, many of hours building rock, or not rock, but block fences and things around these communities to help hide our leaders. And, you know, so it was something that we were happy to do because it was, we were doing it for God's church. And so we thought that it was the best thing we could do. Well, and I guess it's not much different than many faiths who build elaborate uh, temples and, and churches and cathedrals uh, that it's a way of, of expressing your love for God and exactly. Um, but again, it was always troubling to me because the lay person is no different than the prophet other than the calling. Exactly. That's very true. And now that I've been out for a while and looking into the way things used to be when I lived here, of course, I'm very angry to see that Warren Jess specifically and some of the other leaders took advantage of the people here a lot. Yeah. Uh, hey, let's uh, let's run over to the city offices for a moment. Sounds Should great. We? Every time I was in the city office, it was because I was in trouble and had to meet my father there. So this will be interesting. Yeah, we'll see if your stomach starts to get knotted up <laughs> yeah. when we pull up. Here's some video of what things look like today, but I'm also going to show you some video while I'm talking of what Sam's uh, house looked like a few years ago. I actually had it from another video that I did. Sam's father was the mayor of Hildell for many, many years. And during my time at the attorney general's office, I had the opportunity, or, or maybe it's easier to say the uncomfortable responsibility to meet with his dad quite often as we tried to work out ways in which we could bring the community programs of the Attorney General's office into the secret society of Hildale. So you'll be able to see kind of what things looked like at Sam's house then and how they've changed today. And that's really what I want to talk about in this video today is the changes. And once again, folks, I apologize for the terrible audio. I completely missed it. It was so bad outside of the Hildell City offices that I just decided I probably won't even use much of that. To get a better sense of what things were like back then, just go over to Sam and Melissa's channel, Growing Up in Polygamy, and, and catch their episode this coming week on the Hildell City offices. But let me just tell you a little bit about Hildell. I mean, it is tiny. It's only nine square miles. And it's estimated today that there might be 1,000 to 1,200 people living there. But at the height of its uh, glory days, 
just as Warren Jeffs was coming in and starting to destroy it, there were about 2,700 people living there. And my personal guess is 99% of them were members of the FLDS church. They did what Warren Jeffs told them to do. They lived where Warren Jeffs told them to live. They married whoever Warren Jeffs told them to marry, and they walked away from their children if Warren Jeffs told them to. Can you imagine? In fact, if you dig into this rabbit hole, you're going to see so many bizarre uh, revelations that Warren Jeffs came up with. It makes you wonder how anyone stayed. Every bit of the city government was controlled by the FLDS church. That meant fire, police, the city offices. Well, this is probably a really good time to briefly review the stages of leadership in the FLDS church and its communities kind of historically. In 1932, John Barlow and a group of friends became the leaders of the now-formed fundamentalist movement. Not only did they collaborate on the organization of the community, but they served as the religious leaders to the growing band of fundamental dissidents. The leaders called themselves the Council of Friends. And it included John Y. Barlow, who again was the person that started things out, Lauren C. Woolley, J. Leslie Broadbent, Charles Zitting, and that's an important name to remember, Joseph White Musser, LeGrand Woolley, and Louis A. Kelch. Together, they were this governing body of leaders in the organization. And they seemed to get along well, and they seemed to do things for the good of the community. As time went on, and consistent with most cultures where multiple people have kind of a perceived authority, along with their self-proclaimed rights to their forms of revelation, the group began having some disagreements and divisions that uh, were starting to, to tear them apart. Members started choosing sides, leaders, so to speak, and they created these independent subgroups that resulted in the formation of schisms. And those schisms caused break-off fundamentalist groups that still exist today. Some examples of the more successful groups are the Apostolic United Brethren under Allred, the Latter-day Church of Christ, and the Centennial Park Group. And from those were other groups like the Kingston Group you've heard about and uh, the Lafferty's and others. But John Y. Barlow was selected as the first formal leader of the FLDS, and he remained in that position until his death in 1949. When Barlow died, Joseph Musser took over and led the church until his death in 54. And this was a really critical time in the FLDS history because the community, as you might remember, was raided in 1953 by Arizona police officers. That police action is known as the Raid on Short Creek. And I'm going to talk about that in another video. But just before his death, Musser stated that God revealed to him that Rulin Allred should be the next leader of the group. This really angered a bunch of people in the community and revolted in that major breakoff that I was talking about, in part, to the UAB. Instead of Allred, the FLDS faithful named Charles Zitting as the new leader. Rulin Allred took his group and they, they changed and moved and continued the fundamentalist movement in their way under the Apostolic United Brethren. But this is a great time to kind of pause and divert back to the discussions that I was having with Sam Zitting Weissen of, of uh, growing up in polygamy. And, and again, check out his channel. Sam is the descendant of Charles Zitting, this guy that became the leader. His father was the mayor of Hilldale and someone that I worked with from time to time. So as we were out traveling around, Sam and I stopped in front of the Hilldale city offices to talk about that location. Again, the wind was a little bit challenging. Thankfully, Sam's audio guy was able to clean it up a little bit. I've cut out some just to try to get the best audio in here. Let's watch this together. Everyone, welcome back. Sam here with Growing Up in Polygamy. And Mike with Profiling Evil, and it has been a blast so far to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Right now we're standing in front of the iconic town hall here in Gildale, Utah, where my father actually spent a lot of his time as I was growing up out here because he was the mayor of the city. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I can't think of how many times I sat at the long table with your dad and many of the other leaders in this community talking about how to get programs to protect children into the community. I was working as the, uh, in the Attorney General's office for Jan Graham, who was the Attorney General at the time, and we had a program called Safe at Home. Uh -huh. And the idea of the program as we brought it into the, into the polygamous communities was to uh, tell and teach children that there was a place that they could rep report abuses safely which, uh, again, think about that. Yeah, how, are, how are you received? <laughs> well, they, your, your father and many other leaders were always very kind, but it was always very clear that we were going to make uh, microscopic progress in this community. I can imagine. I mean, thinking back on how I felt about outsiders and especially outside law enforcement. I wouldn't have ever dreamt of going and trying to talk with someone from the outside world if I needed help. So I, I was never in a position that I felt that I needed to escape necessarily, so maybe it was different for me. But uh, I can imagine you didn't get a lot of people reaching out. No, no, no. And frankly, one of the things that we learned through that experience and that I've learned throughout my career is that in these kinds of settings where there's coercive mind control, in some cases, and I suspect in this case, talking to law enforcement would be a violation, not only of ethical things, but religious things, because you're talking to the enemy, and in many cases, someone who probably is more aligned with Lucifer, the government, exactly. than uh, with the prophet, yeah. Warren Jeffs or Ruin Jeffs. That is true, and my, you know, we were actually taught to not talk to people. I actually... I planned in my head how I would say it if someone confronted me because I knew that I couldn't say anything. I was taught to not talk to the outsiders if they confronted me and tried to video me. I was told that they would try to trip me up, try to try to force me to say something that would make it, the church look bad. And so we were told not to talk. You know, I have to chuckle. I look behind me here and see the Christmas lights and Christmas decoration on the town hall. <laughs> now that didn't that, happen, did it? That, Christmas was never celebrated and never would have been allowed. So I have to chuckle a little bit. I hope I hope uh, my father can drive by and see that and see how that makes him feel because you know it's it's funny. I think it was Ruthen Jeffs, Warren Jeffs' father, that at one point they were going down to St. George and he told his family. He said it was during Christmas time and he said. If anyone wants to jump in and come down and see the lights of hell, let's go, right? Oh, my and so goodness. So it was uh, definitely frowned upon to have any kind of Christmas decoration or lights. Now, um, Sam, how many years have you been estranged from the FLDS? It's been about 15, 16 years at this point. And in that time, have you seen your parents at all or siblings? So I've seen, so I have siblings that have left as well about, uh, man, getting close to about half of my siblings have moved out now. So I do have a great relationship with those that have moved out. For my siblings that are still in it and following Warren Jeffs, I have not seen them or talked to them. Uh, as far as my parents go, on very rare occasion, I'm able to uh, see or talk with my father. But other than that, I haven't seen my mother in I can't remember how many years. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's not, uh, that's not right and not what's supposed to happen. It's heartbreaking because, you know, she means the world to me. Well, all of my, both of my parents do and all of my siblings, they mean the world to me. And uh, it's, it is very, very difficult. And unfortunately, I knew what I was getting into when I chose to leave because I had seen it happen so many times when I was a part of ch the church. I knew that I wasn't going to be welcome back, but it was a decision I felt that I had to make. And I didn't realize how hard it was going to be on me to not be able to see my family. And especially even more so now that I have my own kids. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Now that I have my own kids, it's made it even that much more difficult. And it's just heartbreaking. You know, you talked about law enforcement in the community. Of course, from the state, uh, the law enforcement folks here were still under police officer standards and training. But everyone kind of recognized that it was the church leading the police department yes. who was out enforcing the laws. 
And, uh, and that created some really difficult positions too, because as an investigator, I could never rely on local law enforcement to uh, share case information or to even back me up if I needed help. I would have to reach out to the Washington County Sheriff. Oh, interesting. Would the local law enforcement, those that were a part of the church and following Warren Jeffs, would they share anything with you or did they try to ignore you? Personally, I never had any information shared from inside the police department here outward. But they were always, again, like your father and like many leaders, uh -huh. they were at face value, very friendly, cordial. Okay. Let's let's team up. <laughs> we're in this together <laughs> and get out of town as soon as you can. Put, Mr. put on a good face. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. You know, my father would come home and I'm maybe he was talking about you sometimes, but sometimes he would come home and he would say, man, I was confronted today when, in my office by so and so from law enforcement and they just they just kept hackling me they would not let me go i mean you can see they're trying to fight against the church and i'm just like oh boy it was frightening as a young boy to think that people are coming into our town and they're trying to destroy what we have here and that was kind of the idea unfortunately for us that when you saw someone like yourself law enforcement coming in we immediately thought you were here to do some kind of harm to us. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? I can't blame a kid in this town for hating and pushing away. They, uh, this, this goes back to a discussion we had earlier about the difference between a convert cult yes. and a generational cult, where from infancy you were raised in an ideology. And what kid doesn't trust their parents? Exactly, especially parents that teach you so strongly, and you can tell that they're so so convinced of what they're teaching you, right? Uh, we didn't really have the option to believe something else. You know, you have a lot of parents out there today that say, this is my belief, but you can choose your belief. You know, it's, it's, it's up to you. That wasn't really an option. It was, this is the truth. This is what we believe. If you believe something else is wrong, <laughs> you know? And so as a young boy, I said, okay, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. And that's what you do as a kid. Yes. Well, so uh, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to go to Warren Jeff's office and talk a little bit about okay. that. And maybe you could help when we're there, share what's happened to that complex and how it now is helping rather yes, than hurting. I would love to. So, hey folks, what we're gonna do is we'll pick up more on the leadership that followed Zitting down through Warren Jeff's in our next video. But for now, I wanna to return to this higher level discussion on Short Creek then and now offices and that was one of my biggest concerns during those years when i was investigating things down there was the fact that i couldn't trust local law enforcement they were controlled like the rest by the flds church leaders again everybody in the community was a member of the flds so only the flds were allowed to access services or even shop in their stores down there that was always an area that I kind of made a point of challenging because every time I went into town, I'd always go to the market and try to purchase a Coke and try to talk to the employees. Rarely would they respond to me. And most of the time, I was completely shunned. And when I say I was shunned, it was a terribly cold shoulder. The men in the community, under the direction of Willie Jessup, the church's security lead, would follow me all around town, taking turns to make it appear like they weren't following me, but it was obvious. I could see the closed-circuit television cameras that were recording my every move, and I am convinced to this day that if I had spoken to anyone, they would have been pulled in after I left town and interrogated to find out what was going on. Yesterday, I went by the home in which Warren Jeffs was living when everything kind of broke loose. I had the chance to speak to Brielle Decker, the 65th wife of Warren Jeffs. And if you remember, again, Warren Jeffs claimed he was a prophet of God. But I want to remind you, that guy is sitting in a Texas prison, convicted of serious sexual crimes against children, and he'll never get out. While we were there, I asked Brielle about the control that the FLDS leadership had over government and the people, and she shared these comments. Yeah, definitely, um, we had fears to even call the police when we were here in town. I did, because um, of that reason, they were FLDS, so I kept looking for ways to escape, 
beyond the town because that was necessary. Um, I did, when I did escape, I ran to a family that had recently left and they drove me to a neighboring city and I stayed with like my mom that adopted me now in another town. And the next day, the police officers from town and also some from St. George went around with a picture of me looking for me door to door. And um, ultimately, they, they tracked um, because they had, FLDS had cameras on some of the houses that I ran into. So they figured out where they took me, but they didn't actually talk to me. They just talked to my mom, who was an activist. And she wasn't my mom at the time, but she was just an activist. But she was amazing in protecting me. And she was like a peer support specialist. She didn't come from FLDS. She came from AUB group, which oh, is okay. similar. Mm -hmm. But she, uh, she, she was out of that also. So she protected me a lot. And she um, kind of told them, like when they came at her telling them that, they, that my biological mother had custody of me, mentally, like psychotic, like, she said, where's the paperwork on that? Because she's saying that's not the case. I also asked her about a time when Warren Jeffs cast out 21 men from one of the church meetings they were holding. He came up with this wacky idea that God wanted him to get rid of them. What he was doing is getting rid of those that might challenge him. I found this journal entry and I used artificial intelligence to create this little audio clip. On December 24th, 2003, Warren Jeffs received a revelation warning him that a number of FLDS men were conspiring against him. He believed his God was warning him that if these men didn't repent, they would be instruments in the hands of the devil to lead many astray. On January 10th, 2004, in a Saturday morning prayer meeting at the Meeting House in Short Creek, Warren Jeffs stood before a gathering of 1,500 faithful and said, I seek unto the Lord that only his will and purpose be done this day. The Lord has placed upon me the mission to search for the pure in heart. Whom the Lord loves, he chastises and grooms. I come with a message of correction and an invitation of repentance. Warren Jeffs' voice was shaky and he continuously cleared it throat. Witnesses said he looked and acted uncomfortable. He then blurted out a startling announcement. He started by having four sons of John Barlow and the four sons of Rulon Jeff stand. Keep in mind, these eight men were all sons of previous FLDS prophets. Warren Jeffs denounced all of them, declaring they were master deceivers. He said, Verily, verily, thus saith the Lord to this people, all those who join with these deceivers and hypocrites will be darkened and will have to be cast out. He then turned to the eight accused men, saying, You judged and criticized legitimate authority. He then turned to their wives and said, All you ladies, married to these men, are released from them and will remove yourselves immediately from their presence. If you don't, I will have to let you go. The congregation was in shock. Nothing like this had ever occurred before. Warren Jeffs then had another 13 men stand and he announced that they too were being cast out. There were 21 men who were singled out, and while they stood with everyone looking at them, Jeffs asked his obedient followers if they agreed with his decision. No one dared go against Jeffs, and they all raised their hands in support of Jeffs' dictate. He asked if anyone disagreed with his demands, and no one had the courage to show how they truly felt. He then ordered everyone to go home and not talk to anyone for two days. But, before they were allowed to leave, he ordered them to join in a word of prayer, promising the membership that the men could return if they repented of their evil ways. The men wandered out in a confused state, not knowing what they had done. This was one example of how Warren Jeffs controlled the members of the group and it extended to civic as well as religious positions. No one was safe. Well, in thinking about that, I also asked Brielle if she was there on the day that this happened. She actually had been married to Warren Jeffs the day before this happened, and she shared these comments. Yeah, so I married him the day before that. Oh, my goodness. And he requested I went to that meeting. So I was furious because one of the FLDS doctrines is you're supposed to have persuasion through love, especially after marriage because it's like a huge thing in everybody's lives. Well, he requested I went to that meeting. He sent me home the, the night after the wedding because I hesitated to, to get close to him. So he sent me home, and then I um, 
I didn't really care at that time. I didn't even realize it was a punishment, but later I figured that out. But he requested I go to that meeting. I sat in there and listened to him banning the, the leaders that we had looked up to for so many years. And I'm like, if I had just heard about this later, I probably wouldn't have been so mad. But this is not persuasion through love. This is like, there's no hope. And this is the guy I married yesterday. You know, like, it was very devastating for me. That was one of the red flags that was in my mind when I went to the secret meeting after that when he talked about the children. Wow. Yeah. And um, one of the things I remember hearing from other members of the FLDS that were in attendance was that he then asked for a sustaining vote after he banished, I think it was like 20 or 21 people, wasn't it? Yeah. He and did that after every meeting, though. Okay. And that was part of the problem with, like, when he got into really secret things in Texas and stuff. Like, it was just like saying amen after, after the end of the prayer. You know, nobody's going to stand up on the time when he says no. So we don't want to be singled out. We don't want to be bullied, especially when we're in like a compound that has a guard tower and a gate around us. You know, we're not going to, you know, and that was just really common. He kind of established that. Still. So, but like, um, I can imagine that it was like the most painful thing, though, just with what I do know. You know, it was probably just antagonizing pain for them. And I never agreed with that, but I never agreed with splitting up all the families either. Like, that was just something internally, and I was like, this is wrong. And then especially when it got into the underage brides, I was like, okay, this is way overboard. <laughs> you know, yeah. I just felt like, I didn't understand the brain and that it develops later and stuff, but like I knew enough to feel like the feelings of like the gut. Well, later that day, while I was still in town, I drove over to a building that was known to me back in the early days as the Steed Sunday School. Today, it's the Hildell Branch of the Washington County Library, and it's filled with books that would have never been allowed in there when Warren Jeffs was in charge. I decided to go inside and see if I could find an old history book, because finding photos is next to impossible. I specifically wanted photographs around that raid that occurred in 1953. I met with the librarian when I went in there. Her name was Ruth, and she happened to be from a polygamous family. And if I remember, I think she told me she had 17 siblings. I asked Ruth if she was in that meeting when Warren Jeffs kicked all the men out. She shared these thoughts. So, um, for me, then, um, I, at first, I was really confused. I was very confused about it because I remember sitting in the meeting when he was kicking out those men and um, that Monday morning. And uh, I remember turning to one of my sisters and saying, why hasn't he kicked us out? We're not any better. But yeah. There were 21 men mm -hmm. yes. that he expelled because right there. he believed to God every, wanted yeah. them chastised. Uh -huh. What was the real reason in your opinion? Um, because they had power and they actually were there to help the community. And he wanted anything that was, you know, to build and help that community, our community. He didn't want us, want them there because people looked up to them. Well, I want to thank Ruth for having the courage to talk to me. You know, her family is a longtime member of this community, going back to the very beginning. In fact, her grandmother actually witnessed the 1953 raid when law enforcement came in and arrested everybody and took all those children into custody. I'm going to talk about that a little more in detail later in another video. But while we were chatting, I also took the opportunity to ask Ruth about the control that the FLDS had over the community and how she felt as she saw Warren Jeffs becoming more and more corrupted. Let's listen to that. Oh, we were just told not to talk to you guys. And we were told to just like ignore you. You didn't exist. We weren't supposed to answer the doors. We weren't supposed to, I mean, that's the kind of stuff we were told to do. Um, I mean, I personally didn't feel like that I was important enough that anybody would even talk to me anyways. So <laughs> I actually grew up with my, I had uncles that were police officers. So I actually had a great, I've always had a great respect for the police. So for me, I actually probably would have said hi. <laughs> but your instruction working in would've, that store would have been... Would have been not, not to talk to you. Yes, would have been not to talk to you. Had I been... Oh, it wasn't you. just uh, people that were outside of town. They would actually start following people in town. They were literally spying on families. Mother said she knows for a fact that they did it to her with the, my sister Eliza after she... Ha or my sister Senia after she had been kicked out. Because my sister Senia actually got kicked out. 
and she went and joined the William E. group at the time. Wow. And um, they literally followed Mother around, and they spied on her and took pictures because she was seeing her apostate daughter. With me, I was completely out of town, so even if they had, you know, they wouldn't have known that they had seen me, that my parents had seen me, because I wasn't in town. Well, this is the perfect point to talk about how Hildell is changing, and it is changing. I mean, you start seeing sidewalks now coming in, something you'd never see before. You see development and growth. But for decades, Hildell was synonymous with the fundamentalist church there, a closed community that was known for its adherence to polygamy and strict patriarchal structures. The men were in charge. But within those dusty streets of this tight-knit town, there are these incredible winds of change blowing. And it's carrying them into, I think, some promises of progress and equality. And at the heart of that transformation is a woman named Donia Jessup. She's really a person that's incredibly determined. She was born and raised in Hildale. She left under a terrible cloud and came back and decided that she needed to make a change. And she decided to run for mayor. Well, she's the kind of person I think that when she sees obstacles, she sees opportunity. And she had a lot of courage and she went forth. Now, her journey isn't without hardships. As she was campaigning for mayor, she faced tremendous opposition from the entrenched male leadership of the FLDS. They saw her candidacy as a direct affront to their authority. It was a threat to the very fabric of the society that they had, more importantly, that they controlled. They launched smear campaigns against her. They spread rumors. They did everything that they could to undermine her credibility. But Donia refused to be deterred, and with the support of her friends, family, and really a growing coalition of allies, she pressed on, and she won the mayor's uh, election. Rest to warn Jeffs, the southern Utah polygamous town of Hilldale continues to change. The once predominantly FLDS town has its first year with a female mayor under its belt. ABC4's Haley Higgins has a look at Donya Jessup's first historic year. It was a historic victory over a longtime incumbent mayor. But one can argue the victory heard across the Beehive State was also a victory against patriarchy. I feel like I've made my entire family proud. Um, I'm very much in connection with most of them, and they are very proud of me. Hildell Mayor Donia Jessup was a fundamentalist Latter-day Saint. When she left the FLDS sect, she made the tough decision to leave behind the town and the people she grew up with and loved. But then she returned as an outsider. I, I went back because the mountains called me back. And I could see that the people that were still there, they were hungry for community. They just felt compelled to go home. Almost one year ago, Jessup beat insider and longtime mayor Philip Barlow, an FLDS loyalist in a contentious race. It's very important that our voices are heard, that we step up and say what's important to us. The town was divided between those still loyal to their befallen leader, convicted child molester Warren Jeffs, and those wanting change following Jeff's brutal reign. But Mayor Jessup says over the course of her first year as mayor, the support has increased. We've seen a complete transformation of the city. Um, I, I think people were a little nervous in the beginning, not sure how we would make it all work, if it would work. But we have seen so many people come together. We've seen a community start to rebuild. The victory was quite the feat when you consider two federal juries in Arizona found Hildale, an adjoining town, Colorado City, discriminated against non-FLDS residents. It is seriously through her compassion, through her deep understanding of the barriers and fears of the population, that she has been able to be a, an incredible bridge between what was and what is. Shirley Draper served as Mayor Jessup's campaign manager. Despite the heated race, she says Mayor Jessup doesn't hold a grudge and serves with compassion. 
maybe another mayor would not have been as compassionate to people who are still FLDS. You know, she extends that olive branch and, and that diplomacy. Hildell, Utah, a town once ruled by patriarchy, is now one of the most progressive in the state when it comes to women in politics. For example, we do have two other city council members who are female. So there are three men and two women on the city council, and I think that's, they're, Hilldale's leading the way in a number of metrics <laughs> by that measure. The mayor believes it's imperative that more women get involved in Utah politics. She hopes the political transformation underway in her town inspires girls and young women across Utah. In Hilldale, Haley Higgins, ABC4 News. Victory, uh, elected as the town's first female mayor and first mayor that wasn't a member of the FLDS church. She shattered century-old barriers and ushered in a real new era of progress. Now, the streets, I think, were probably erupting in celebration while people on the backside were chewing their tongues. But people were really excited about this. But amidst all the jubilation... There were people who, in my opinion, were probably seething with anger and resentment. The leaders of the FLDS Church viewed Dania's election as a direct challenge, again, to their authority, a betrayal of the deeply held beliefs that they had. They rallied against her from the pulpit, and they denounced her as a heretic and a traitor. They warned their followers to shun her, and resist her efforts at every single turn. That's back when I met her right after she became mayor. I actually traveled out with the prosecution council to meet with her and share some of my experiences during my investigative years. Well, well despite their efforts, Dania refused to be swayed and she reached out to members of the FLDS community with compassion and understanding. She sought to bridge gaps that were created there. She tried listening to their concerns. She acknowledged their fears. I think she offered them a vision of a brighter future. Some that, some ideas that probably they were frightened to even verbalize that they agreed with. Slowly, but surely her message began to resonate and bit by bit hearts seemed to be softening. Minds are opening a little and walls seem to be coming down a little bit. People who once viewed uh, Donia with suspicion might now actually look at her as an ally or a friend. But when she came in as mayor, it was incredible what happened because a huge amount of her staff immediately resigned. She tried to convince them to stay, but they said it would go against their uh, religious beliefs. And they also said they wouldn't work for a woman. <laughs> well, they're probably working for one now. So now under Dania's leadership, Hildell's beginning to undergo this really profound transformation. Businesses are starting to spring up. Parks will hopefully be revitalized. Infrastructure improved. Um, as these women are taking some leadership roles, they're getting diversity in things that are going on. We're seeing houses built out there that I would have never expected. Some that are beautiful. And the town is changing. There are so many people that are not members of the FLDS church. I suspect more that are not members of the FLDS than are members of the FLDS. And that's a video that I'm going to talk about a little later about this mass exodus that Warren Jeffs ordered and that continues today. Well, well folks, I got to salute the new mayor of Hildale and I got to salute the leaders in Colorado City because as I drive around, I see real change going on. I see people that are a little more trusting of government and people that are a lot more willing to talk to a galump like me when I stop to visit with them. I hope hey, before we call it a day, make sure you subscribe because next week on Fundamentalist Friday, we're going to continue our exploration into the FLDS Church leadership and make our way over to the place where Rulin Jeffs and later Warren Jeffs warehoused their 70 plus wives. And I'm going to talk to one of the wives of Warren Jeffs who felt like she was a hostage, somebody that was coerced into daily prayers 
and coercive mind control. We're going to be going to the pray and obey house. I hope that you've enjoyed this episode in our deep dive into the FLDS fundamentalist community. We've been looking around in Hildale, Utah and Colorado City, Arizona. They're right on the border next to each other. The old timers call the area Short Creek. And so you might hear me use different names as we talk about this thing. I hope that you'll take a moment and enter your comments down below and share your thoughts about what you're seeing and hearing and learning in this. Take time to talk to each other and remember to hit the like and subscribe button. And please, folks, share Profiling Evil with your friends. I don't know if you're aware, but you can find Profiling Evil on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And folks, if you like podcasts in audio form, check out Profiling Evil Podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. I also hope you'll go over and check out our website at profilingevil.com. And while you're there, make sure you're signing up for the BOLO. It stands for Be On The Lookout. And above all, don't forget about choir practice. Hey everybody, look who I'm hanging out with. And uh, listen, I'm not attending choir practice, but I just wanted to tell you that you need to be watching Profiling Evil YouTube. Don't miss it. I'm telling you, there's something there for you every single time. I never miss. You shouldn't either. In our next choir practice, I'm going to be joined by former New York City Police Department Homicide Commander Tom Joyce. He and I are also going to be joined by our friend Chief Kenny Kinsey. You'll remember him from the Murdoch trial. And we're going to have a special guest, Miss Ashley Solomon. She's going to be talking about a missing person case that she refuse to let go silent. You're not going to want to miss that one. So thanks so much for your support, and we'll see you all soon at the next crime scene.